Okay, so we'll we'll do a bit of a, a kind of go around and a hello um, after we've gone through our presentation and so on. And um, so there will be a chance to ask questions and to um, to bring forward any uh, both ideas you've got about how we can tackle the issues we're going to talk about um, in this webinar, uh, and also kind of respond to to what you've heard. Um, the, um, Sally and I are going to talk for uh, about 20 or so minutes and we're going to try and introduce you all to some of the important context around the Scottish Parliament Pension Fund uh, to, to explain to you why we think this issue is important. Um, we're going to talk about other successful campaigns and what we can learn from them uh, and we're going to talk about the specifics of uh, what is actually going on uh, in Holyrood and what our political leaders are and um, uh, the kind of decisions they're making and, and how perhaps we can get involved uh, to uh, make sure that they're setting um, a good example in terms of how they're investing and what this could mean um, for Scotland uh, moving away from fossil fuels as a whole. Um, so um, to start with my name is Rick Lander and I'm divestment campaigner at Friends of the Earth Scotland. Uh, we uh, Friends of the Earth Scotland is an organisation that campaigns uh, for environmental justice on a really broad range of topics but specifically a lot of our work is focused on trying to get <clears throat> a just transition away from fossil fuels here in Scotland and we think money is a big part of that and that we need uh, investors uh, across the country institutions and and uh, leading organizations to be putting their money where their mouth is on climate change and getting out of, of fossil fuels because ultimately Fossil fuel companies are the biggest block that we have right now to taking uh, meaningful, effective action against climate change. Um, big fossil fuel companies like um, BP and Shell, and we'll hear more about them later, uh, are actively uh, lobbying uh, our governments to try and uh, withhold regulations and new pieces of legislation, uh, taxation, um, that would make it harder for them to get fossil fuels out of the ground. <clears throat> and if they get their way, they'll be extracting more and more fossil fuels out of the ground, and that is going to commit us to more and more dangerous climate change. So we need to go fossil free. Scotland's in a brilliant position to do that. And getting the money uh, in behind that transition uh, is a really important part of that, um, that journey that, that Scotland's going to go on and how we're going to achieve climate justice around the world. Um, so to start with, um, I want to uh, talk about a little bit about what this has to do with pensions, because um, pensions is not a particularly uh, enthralling topic, and it's not something that um, activists tend to talk about very much, and it's not something environmentalists tend to talk about very much. Um, and I would say it's not something the general public talks about very much, um, but it is actually very important. And um, we've been uh, looking at um, how the pensions industry and the financial industry and the kind of decisions it's been making on the path of the, the rest of society uh, and why um, uh, why actually it's incumbent on all of us as, as citizens uh, to get involved um, in, in what the pensions industry is doing on our behalf because uh, in theory the pensions industry exists uh, to make sure that when people are no longer working that they, they've got enough income to look after themselves um, but actually a lot of decisions being made by the pension industry are funding a future uh, which is really very much bleaker for people all around the world. Uh, and uh, it's incumbent on all of us to try and get involved and intervene and, and change that. And um, so I'm gonna show you a, a slide, uh, assuming the technology works, of to give you an idea of the, the scale of um, the, uh, the pension industry. And if you just bear with me, because I've not done this before. I'm seeing some smiles, that's good, okay. So what this is, um, this is just a picture of uh, a bunch of, of different, really big pots of, of money, mostly public money in the UK. And uh, some of these numbers are the kind of numbers that we hear banded about on the news quite a lot. And I think this is useful to explore a little bit because um, some of these numbers are so large that it's really hard to kind of wrap your head around them. Um, and uh, the, the blob on the bottom left here, which is 37.5 billion pounds, that was the, the original first bailout that uh, the big banks got uh, in the financial crisis. So in 2008, when, when the banks um, went belly up and they, they called the chancellor to say, 
we've really mucked up like we're going to go insolvent and um, we need a lot of money and we need it quickly um 37 billion pounds was the amount of money which the uk government originally provided uh, to back them up um, it's a similar amount of money than that uh, Britain's nuclear weapons system was originally supposed to cost. And um, both of those amounts of money have gone up since, but they've always been described as being unprecedentedly huge, like a really, really uh, exorbitant amount of money. And um, if you compare that to some of the smaller blobs, kind of things that we often hear about in the news, at the top right, you can see the London Olympics, that costs about 10 billion pounds. Uh, so on the original bill, you could get three Olympic games for the amount of money that uh, a Trident nuclear weapons system cost you, um, which I think is the Olympic Games quite good value for money, but um, maybe that's not a conversation for today. <laughs> um, but you can see that even smaller blob there, the, on just below the Olympics, 7.2 billion pounds uh, was the UK government aid budget. Now that data is um, a few years old, um, but it gives you some idea about what uh, what we mean when when newspapers say that something you know is incredibly expensive. Actually, uh, the uh, the amount of money we give to um, poorer countries um, is actually really small uh, in compared to some of the, the kind of big vanity projects which our governments are spending money on. But all of these numbers are actually smaller um, than the value of um, pension schemes. And again, some of this money, this data is a little out of date, but the, uh, in this was, I think, 2012 data that you can see the NHS um, pension scheme was valued at 37 billion pounds. Uh, the university superannuation scheme, which is just the top level of university staff, uh, was £32 billion. Um, and last year's data shows that Scottish local councils' pensions are worth around £40 billion. So pension, pension funds look after a huge amount of money. Uh, it's incredibly, uh, incredibly powerful. Um, uh, that money is incredibly powerful. And um, how it's invested uh, is going to affect the kind of future that we live in. Uh, and that's why it's important for us to get involved in this um, and get involved in a discussion about how pensions are invested. So there's an, there's an importance when we talk about MSP pensions about, uh, about the political leadership here, for sure. But there's also an issue about the, the financial industry, which is currently pouring, still pouring huge amounts of money into oil, coal and gas. Pensions industry is doing that too. So if we can get MSPs to um, be showing some leadership and, and cleaning up their own pension fund, that could be a part of a, a much broader change across the financial industry uh, and across the pensions industry too. So um, pensions, is, pensions is big business, big business and we need uh, our MSPs to be understanding the, the context in which uh, they're currently uh, neglecting their duty to, to really set a good example to the pension industry uh, and there'll be some people on this call who have been actively involved in uh, campaigning to reform pension funds and um, over the last uh, uh, four years or so there's been uh, literally hundreds of, of campaigning efforts going on across the UK to get local council pension funds uh, to clean up their act and they've had some amazing successes with uh, local council pension funds pledging to completely divest from fossil fuels, uh, which uh, is really kind of like a world, world leading approach that you, some of those UK councils have led on. Um, we haven't had uh, outright victory in any Scottish councils uh, and uh, political support has been something of a block to that. So another uh, piece of context to this campaign is that perhaps if we can get MSPs to support, if we can get the Scottish Parliament to support divestment, then that might help us win uh, campaigns uh, elsewhere where we're trying to win fossil free. Um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Sally, who's going to talk to us about uh, a similar campaign that's been run with the Westminster Pension Fund. So over to you, Sally. Thank you. I'm just trying to share the screen. Can everybody see that? It says Diverse Parliament Campaign. Great. So the Divest Parliament campaign is a partner campaign to the new Scottish Parliament one. And it started at the end of 2016. It was begun by Caroline Lucas, and it's trying to divest the Westminster Parliament from fossil fuel companies. The pension fund for the Westminster Parliament is currently investing in some of the biggest fossil fuel companies, including BP, Shell and Total 
and it is managed by 12 cross-party MPs. Sorry, it's gone too far. It's managed by 12 cross-party MPs. And the main aims of the campaign are trying to ask MPs to sign a pledge to divest their individual parliamentary pension fund from fossil fuels. We're trying to remove investments from fossil fuels and although that's not going to make a huge financial impact on these fossil fuel companies, we're aiming to show that it's unacceptable to invest in companies that are actively damaging the planet, like BP and Shell. And these companies are still spending huge amounts of money in oil, gas and coal exploration and very little money in renewable energy. So the campaign is trying to damage their reputations as well as removing money from these companies. It's also highlighting the financial risk to pensions and all of our investments by continuing to invest in these fossil fuel companies. Because if we're going to keep global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees, most fossil fuel reserves have to stay in the ground around the world and carrying on investing in these companies is a huge financial risk. And the Divest Parliament campaign is part of a much wider divestment movement, not just in Britain, but all around the world. And it includes university campaigns, local councils and church campaigns. We are organised in regional teams. There are volunteers all around the country. I've been volunteering with the campaign for about two years now. And people just spend as much time as they can. It's very, very flexible. And some people are very involved, some people less involved, and it's, it doesn't matter at all. In Scotland, we currently have six team members. There are two of us in Glasgow, and we also have volunteers in Edinburgh, East Lothian, Dundee, and the Borders. And we get lots and lots of support from all the campaigners around the country, particularly there's one campaigner who's a bit like Rick, who's called Titus in London, and he helps all of us. And we meet a lot online. We have a WhatsApp group where we share lots of ideas and we also have face to face meetings. And that's something that we maybe could do for or hopefully can also do for the Diverse Scotland campaign. And the way that the campaign works is that regional teams will chat about different MPs that we hope might be supportive and interested in signing the Divest Parliament pledge. And then we'll choose an MP to contact. And ideally, we try to find local constituents for that MP. So we might look at local green parties or groups who are interested in environmental issues, wildlife or conservation groups. Sometimes there are transition town groups that we'll try and contact or Extinction Rebellion groups. And we ask them if they would be willing to email or even phone their MP. And ideally, it's also fantastic if anyone is happy to meet their MP and ask them to sign the Divest Parliament pledge. And this not only helps the MPs learn more about climate issues, but it also builds up a really nice relationship with constituents and shows the MPs how much people care about climate change and the climate crisis. Sometimes we can't always find constituents who want to contact their MP. So we also contact MPs directly through email and phone. And sometimes it's, it's really helpful if several members of a particular party have already signed the pledge. It's been really useful with the SNP. When we were trying to persuade Glasgow SNP MPs to sign, we said, well, all the other SNP MPs have signed in Glasgow. Would you like to sign as well? And that really helped. And some milestones for the campaign so far. The first one came in December 2017 when 100 MPs signed and our 100th pledge was Jeremy Corbyn. And then in December 2018, 200 MPs signed and we've got a little video through the link that's a celebration of the MPs, the 200 MPs. Today we got two more pledges, so we're currently at 246. We're now about a third of all MPs, current and former MPs in the Parliament. And in Scotland, 42 of the 59 MPs have signed the pledge, which is really exciting. 
That includes almost all of the Scottish Labour MPs, which has just got one to go for Scottish Labour. There's one Lib Dem who hasn't signed yet. We do have one Conservative pledge. They are proving a little more challenging, but we're going to keep trying. And 32 out of the 35 SNP MPs have already signed, which is amazing. And the photo is from the recent SNP conference. These are some of the supportive SNP MPs. And our future plans are ideally, we hope to win the campaign. We want to persuade the pension fund trustees to divest from fossil fuels. So far, they haven't been very interested in divestment. They've been quite resistant and they said they had to have a much larger number of MPs before they would even consider it. But we're trying to put some more pressure on them and we've managed to secure a Westminster Hall debate next Wednesday. The Westminster Hall is slightly different from the normal Westminster debates. There isn't going to be an actual vote but it's a really good way of getting MPs to talk about climate change. And we're hoping to push the climate crisis much higher up the political agenda and make it a real priority for MPs. And also raise a lot more awareness that divestment is a very positive tool that we can all use to reduce our carbon emissions. And by taking money out of the fossil fuel companies, that frees up that money, which can then be reinvested in renewable energy and help the transition to the zero carbon economy. And as I said, we're hoping to put a little bit of pressure on the pension fund trustees and also build solidarity amongst the 246 MPs who've already signed. We're asking as many MPs as possible to attend the debate. And I recently had a meeting with Sandra White, who is the SMP MSP for Glasgow Kelvin. And she works very closely with the SMP MPs in Glasgow and said they often have a lot of conversations. She's heard about the Divest Parliament campaign from her SMP colleagues in Westminster. And she said, if things like this debate are happening in Westminster, then they're more likely to have something similar in the Holyrood Parliament. So hopefully it will help encourage more MSPs to talk about the climate crisis and divestment as a really positive solution. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to put them in the chat box or just ask me. And you can, sometimes we put an asterisk in if you want to ask any questions. Thank you for that, Sally. And um, it's really inspiring to hear about what the Divest Parliament campaign has achieved. Um, for the Westminster Pension Fund and, uh -huh. and just to be clear this is a, a UK-wide campaign which has been uh, really driven by a, a group of volunteers from across the country. Um, uh, can I just ask that if you're not, um, and, until we go to the Q&A at the end, uh, if you could keep your, um, keep your microphone on mute, that would be really appreciated. Um, we had a quick quick question in the chat box um, for Sally which was to ask when the Westminster Hall debate was and I was also just wondering if Sally you could quickly relate um, how long the Divest Parliament campaign has been running and if uh, you could maybe just give a picture of like, how long it took to kind of generate the support which you now have. So it started at the end of 2016 around December 2016 um, I joined the campaign in the summer of 2017 when we had about 50 pledges and by December 2000, 2017 we had 100 pledges and by this December 2018 we had 200 pledges. So it's, it's taken maybe two and a half years but we've got 650 odd MPs that we're trying to persuade and we don't need to get all of the MPs, we just need to get a critical mass and put pressure on the trustees and that will win the campaign. So it's building and building, which is really exciting. And in answer to the question, the debate is happening next Wednesday afternoon at 2.30 in the afternoon. I can send around some information about it and we would absolutely love it if you didn't mind inviting your MP to attend the debate. That would be incredible, thank you. Thanks, Sally. And I think um, that two and a half year timeline is worth bearing in mind because for uh, in the Scottish Parliament, uh, we, we're trying to run this campaign essentially on a, 
kind of a super fast timetable because we we learned um, very that over a very short period of time a number of important decisions were going to be made about whether the Scottish Parliament and whether the Scottish government would uh, divest from fossil fuels um, and 2019 is a big year in the Scottish Parliament for this and we'll come on to this later um, but we'll need to, we'll need kind of all the help that we can get uh, and to to try and emulate some of the success that the Divest Parliament campaign has had across the UK uh, to, to do that in um, in super quick time. Uh, the um, I'm going to and that kind of brings us on to uh, the Scottish Parliament more generally um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then um, hand back to Sally to, to hear specifically about the MSP pensions. Um, and do bear in mind as we go through, if you've got any questions, put them in the chat box um, and we'll, we'll get through those at the end. We'll have plenty of time for discussion before we close. Um, so the, the Scottish Parliament, which is a, uh, often known as Holyrood, because that's a part of town it's based in, in Edinburgh, uh, has uh, responsibility for making decisions uh, about how Scotland is governed in, um, in the vast majority of areas. So there are a number of reserved issues. Um, but uh, the Scottish Parliament makes uh, decisions uh, about um, how the budget is spent, about how our uh, schools and hospitals and police service are run, uh, and uh, MSPs, of which there are 129. They make, they're elected from across the country, and they make decisions uh, to uh, represent the views of their constituents. Uh, and unlike in Westminster, in, in London Parliament, where every person only has one in it, um, in Scotland, you have a, a, a multitude of representatives in the Scottish Parliament, and that's because you have a local constituency MSP, uh, as well as a number of regional MSPs, and that's how uh, the Scottish Parliament is more uh, proportional in terms of how it represents people, because it, uh, you have more than one MSP that uh, is elected from, from where you are. And um, so that's helpful to us because that actually means that um, any one person has the opportunity to, to lobby a larger number of, um, of individuals you know, just to gather support for this campaign. Um, but the, the context um, around what's going on in the Scottish Parliament at the moment uh, makes this campaign really, really timely and really interesting because there's lots of important things happening um, with the efforts uh, to tackle climate change in the Scottish Parliament at the moment. Um, we have uh, a Just Transition Commission has just been set up in order to uh, oversee uh, how we uh, move away from a fossil fuel dependent economy. And that only started meeting a few months ago. And um, MPs, MSPs, I should say, have been debating a new climate change oh, act in yeah. Scotland and agreeing new climate targets about how we're gonna reduce our, our carbon emissions in Scotland. Um, the, the Scottish government and the parliament is in the process of setting up a new national investment bank, uh, which uh, they've said is gonna be important in the fight against climate change. Uh, although they haven't really made clear um, how. And the, the Scottish um, Parliament uh, and S Scottish politicians have also been um, uh, used their voice in the debate around aviation in really critical ways recently. And we had last week an announcement that a planned tax cut, which the Scottish Parliament was going to be asked to enact, um, has been scrapped. Um, but the SNP MPs have also been quite crucial in lending their support for expansion of Heathrow Airport in London. Uh, so aviation has been a, an important political issue in Scotland uh, and it's, it's hugely important um, that we understand you know, how we reduce emissions from aviation as we fight climate change. Um, and also uh, the transport um, role of the Scottish Parliament uh, has been historically very important in terms of the way that the Scottish Government and Parliament has consistently approved budgets uh, which have um, maintained and kind of um, deepened our reliance on our road transportation uh, and maintaining our demand for fossil fuels and um, through our transportation system uh, as opposed to um, investing in electric powered uh, public transport and, and other alternatives and um, so uh, and there's uh, a transport bill that has been going through parliament this year as well so there's lots of things which are happening like right now which are really really important in the broader uh, debate on climate change and uh, MSPs have a say in almost all of those things and they can provide leadership and um, critically on on fossil fuels and um, the the Scottish Parliament also has uh, has a key role to play um, the uh, 
the the parliament and the government uh, instigate um, uh, gave a direction of travel that it wanted to um, do what it could, if you like, to ban fracking. But that hasn't uh, that has that process hasn't been completed, if you like, and that's still kind of ongoing. Um, we've uh, heard a lot in the last few uh, weeks with a new report out today about what the Scottish Parliament's role is in moving um, in, in instigating the end of the offshore oil industry in Scotland, which is obviously economically hugely important and for many years has been kind of a no-go topic. And uh, many Scottish parliamentarians have uh, gone out of their way to, to provide a huge amount of kind of cheerleading and support for Scotland's oil and gas industry. And we really need that to end. We need them to be cheerleading for the renewables industry. And um, so all of these, all of these things are secondary, um, but really critical um, bits of context for, uh, for talking about divestment with our MSPs. And um, it's not just about asking them to make a decision about their pension pot um, and how, whether, which companies it's invested in, because um, all of those things also connect to um, how the Parliament and how the Scottish Government uh, tackles climate change more broadly. And if we can get our MSPs on board with the idea that their own money through their own pension fund should be <coughs> invested in uh, uh, companies who are uh, enabling the fossil fuel economy, then that could be really important in terms of opening their minds about how Scotland as a nation uh, can uh, have a meaningful transition away from uh, continually trying to expand the oil and gas industry uh, and uh, and have fossil fuel dependent transport and heating and so on. Uh, so there's lots um, that, that we can win through looking at this issue um, beyond purely um, just the pension funds, although as I've said um, before, mm -hmm. the pension industry and the financial industry is really important as well. Um, so we're looking for that political leadership. Um, it's, we're asking for MSPs to make um, better decisions about how they invest their own money, but we're also asking them to be climate leaders and to think about what that means for uh, all of the other areas of responsibility um, that they have. Um, so I'll, I'll head back to Sally now to tell us about the MSP's pension fund and what it actually is and uh, who's a part of it um, and uh, who, who runs the pension fund. Um, so over, you, over to you, Sally. Good. Um, so this is a little bit of an overview of the Scottish Parliamentary Pension Fund. It currently invests £82 million and it's a pension fund for 129 MSPs and that includes our 73 constituency MSPs and also our 56 regional MSPs. And the, if you'd like to see a list of the current MSPs, there's a link there. Now, a big problem with the pension fund is it currently has absolutely no ethical policy for its investments. But this investment or lack of investment, ethical investment policy is being reviewed by MSPs at the moment. So we're hoping that they will introduce one. The environmental journalist Rob Edwards has done a lot of research into the pension fund's investments. And it's currently investing in fossil fuel companies, tobacco firms and arms companies such as Rolls-Royce and in terms of fossil fuels the pension fund is investing over one million pounds in coal oil and gas companies mm -hmm. including some of the top five or the, the three of the top 25 companies which are most responsible for climate change and they're companies like BHP Billiton, Rio Tinto and Shell and Rick's going to tell us a little bit more in a moment about these companies and why they are such bad companies to invest in. They have terrible human rights records as well as the damage they're doing to the climate. Now the pension fund itself is managed by a private investment firm called Bailey Gifford. And we understand that Bailey Gifford does offer fossil free policies for investors. Now, Edinburgh University also invests with Bailey Gifford and they have been talking to some of the MSPs about their fossil fuel divestment plans and hopefully giving them advice about alternatives to fossil fuel investment. So that's quite encouraging. <laughs> there are some key MSPs who are involved in overseeing the pension fund for the Scottish Parliament. 
there are five current MSPs on the, who are trustees and also one pensioner trustee. So they are Tavish Scott, who is the chair of the Pension Fund Trustees. He is the Liberal Democrat MSP for Shetland. Unfortunately, he's very, very keen on fossil fuels. We also have other cross-party MSPs. We have a really amazing ally in Mark Ruskell, who is the Green MSP for Mid-Scotland and Fife. And also we're hoping that Pauline McNeil might become an ally. She is the Labour MSP for Glasgow. She attended the recent climate bill rally that happened in Edinburgh and she has called for investigations into the pension fund's lack of an ethical policy. So we're hoping to try and build up more of a relationship with her. There are some other key MSPs that we need to think about and these trustees are looking into introducing an ethical investment policy. They're talking to Bailey Gifford at the moment. We're hoping they might introduce one this summer and we know that they had a meeting last week and Mark Rusko has given a little bit of feedback to Rick and said that Bailey Gifford does seem to be willing to suggest alternatives that are more ethical for the pension fund to invest in. So we're hoping that the more MSPs we can persuade to sign the Diverse Scotland pledge, the more that will encourage the pension fund trustees to really look at these alternatives to fossil fuel investments. So as well as these MSPs, there are some other key people that can help us. They are part of the Scottish Parliamentary corporate body and they can raise questions and ask the pension fund trustees about their investment policy. These are the members, if you can see the picture, and they include Sandra White, who's the SMP MSP for Glasgow Kelvin, also Ken McIntosh, who is the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament, Kezia Dugdale, who's the Lothian Labour MSP, Liam MacArthur, who is the Lib Dem MSP for Orkney, Andy Whiteman, who's again an ally, he is the Green Party Lothian MSP, and Jackson Carlaw, who's the Conservative MSP in the West of Scotland. So if any of them happen to be your MSP, then you can certainly contact them and ask them to raise questions. They're willing to ask any questions to the pension fund trustees. And we're going to be covering this in a future webinar, but part of our Divest Scotland campaign is not just for the pension fund and trying to persuade it to go fossil free. It's also asking MSPs to sign a pledge to ensure that the new Scottish National Investment Bank is fossil free when it is finally put into law. So that's another thing that's part of the pledge. Okay, Rick, back to you. Thanks, Sally. And I've just posted um, the link to the Google group for the Divest Scotland campaign. So if you're uh, interested in signing up to take part, uh, then you can click that link and follow the instructions. Uh, and then, um, yeah, do keep using the chat box if you've got any queries. Thanks to those who've already raised stuff. Um, so um, just to elaborate a little bit on some of the things that, that Sally was talking about regarding the MSP's um, pension fund. Uh, the um, I'm going to show uh, on my screen here the list of the um, the the biggest um, excuse me. So the, uh, what you can see there uh, are the uh, top ten individual companies that the Scottish Parliament Pension Fund uh, currently invests in. So this is very up to date data. This is from the last uh, from the last few weeks actually, and. Uh, some of those companies will be fairly unfamiliar to you. Some of them are sort of hedge funds and fairly, uh, fairly shady, obscure things. Um, and some of them are, are kind of not great, but fairly neutral. Um, and, but there's also some major fossil fuel companies in there. So um, the single biggest uh, company that the Parliament Pension Fund owns uh, is BHP Billiton, which is extraordinary in my opinion, because uh, one of the, uh, they have, one of the poorest human rights records of, of, of any major company on uh, the kind of London Stock Exchange. Um, they've been uh, accused of, of bribery in recent years in a number of different countries. 
uh, they, uh, within the last five years, they had a major project to open up uh, huge mining concessions in the center of the rainforest in, uh, on Borneo, uh, which is, I mean, really one of just the worst combination of, of, uh, of different kinds of evils taking place in one place. Um, we had speakers come to Scotland a few years ago talking about BHP Billiton's uh, Serachon mine, which is one of the largest open cast uh, coal mines in the world. And it's in northern Colombia. And uh, one of the, the speakers, a guy called uh, Samuel Aragoches, uh, he was talking about uh, how his village, his whole village, had been evicted to make way for the expansion of a coal mine in northern Colombia. Uh, and this was fairly, fairly typical uh, experience of, of facing this company. Um, the uh, probably one of the main ways in which people may have heard of BHP Billiton, although they are still a fairly obscure company despite their size, uh, was the Samarco Dam collapse, um, which was in 2015. Uh, and it, uh, a number of people died when a, uh, a, uh, a dam that was holding back a, a tailings pond broke. Um, and this was the largest environmental disaster in Brazil. And this wasn't a, uh, this wasn't a coal mine, this was a different kind of mine. Uh, BH Billiton, BHP Billiton run all kinds of uh, different minerals extractions around the world. Um, but they've been yeah, accused of, of multiple kind of um, multiple uh, environmental and human rights failings. And this is a quote from uh, a representative of the churches and mining network in Latin America uh, regarding that disaster in 2015. Uh, a guy called Rodrigo de Castro Amede Pere. And he said, the dam break led to the destruction of all forms of life in the region. Mud covered everything, resulting in 20 deaths and unmeasurable environmental destruction. We have seen whole communities destroyed by BHP Billiton's operations. They have lost everything without receiving any compensation. Instead of reparations for the victims, what is becoming evident is the blatant corporate capture of our governments by transnational companies. So that was in 2015, and uh, BHP Billiton, uh, as, as well as their sort of very poor uh, record in terms of disaster, um, accidents and local environmental damage, uh, are also uh, one of the top 10 producers of coal in the world. Uh, so, and that's the single largest company that, that the Parliament Pension Fund uh, invests in, which is just extraordinary. And um, also on that list, you can see um, near the bottom, you see a company called Rio Tinto. Uh, they're also one of the largest mining companies in the world and have been accused of multiple um, pollution breaches and uh, human rights abuses. Um, and the, the one that you're probably more familiar with is fourth on the list, which is uh, Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, which is the, the corporate name of Shell. And uh, Shell are one of the top 10 largest oil and gas producers in the world. Um, they've been implicated uh, in a number of incidents involving um, bribery. Uh, they've been linked with the assassination of activists who've been trying to stop development of oil concessions. Uh, and they're a huge um, supporter of fracking around the world. Um, they've currently got unconventional gas operations, I'm just reading from my notes here, uh, in Canada, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, and South Africa, and there's been protests and resistance in all of those places. Uh, Shell have gone to considerable efforts in recent months to try and paint themselves as being uh, a sort of good guy on climate change. Um, but most of this is to do with the fact that they're, they're pushing more and more to become a gas company. Uh, and less an oil company. And because gas is slightly less bad than oil, they're able to kind of dress that up as being a, a pro-environmental uh, switch. Um, but there's really no sign that Shell are in any way serious about moving away from fossil fuels and uh, reducing the extraction of fossil fuels. Uh, and you know, until we see that from any of these companies, um, there's no way we can take uh, any of their greenwash seriously. And um, so, and um, these are, uh, so the kinds of fossil fuel companies um, that uh, the Scottish Parliament Pension Fund invests in uh, are not kind of small wee outfits in, in Aberdeen, which maybe are supporting lots of Scottish jobs or uh, it seems kind of like very friendly corporate entities. 
Um, these are some of the biggest, most destructive companies in the world. And it's just really not acceptable in 2019 for our MSPs to be claiming that they're leading on climate change uh, whilst continuing to invest in these companies. And having said that, uh, I think there is, we've had a lot of support and enthusiasm from MSPs that this does need to change. I think they see that it is potentially embarrassing for them and that, uh, that they need to make a switch. And Sally mentioned uh, that the company who currently is contracted to invest money on their behalf uh, uh, has provided with them with some alternatives. Um, and I, I looked on a, a, a website uh, run by an American organization called As You So, uh, and they provide uh, a bit of a background to different uh, fund managers. Uh, and when I put uh, the Parliament's fund manager, Bailey Gifford, into that website uh, and showed that they had, um, they had one fund which they run, which is completely fossil free, uh, and another uh, which uh, is not fossil free, but is vastly better than what they're currently doing. So there's, there's lots of options for good places that they could go. And um, <coughs> the understanding is that the, the issue is very live. They're kind of investigating it. They have very frequent meetings, the trustees. Um, and if we can influence the trustees to make um, that there is support within the Scottish Parliament um, membership at large, so all of those 129 MSPs uh, at some point in their life will probably rely on this pension fund for their income, and all of them should have a say in that, uh, and they have the opportunity to lobby their colleagues. Um, so if we can show that support, then there's actually every opportunity to win this campaign, honestly, within the next few months. Um, so that's really exciting um, and it would it's partly exciting because all of those communities that are having to deal with BHP Billiton you know destroying their homes and uh, shell uh, oil spills uh, destroying their villages in Nigeria uh, and uh, Rio Tinto destroying mountainsides in Indonesia and so on all of those communities would be uh, hugely buoyed and empowered to know that in Scotland uh, the political leaders had told me um, to get to. So this is this is like has a will have a global impact as well, both in providing that solidarity to people who are on the front lines against fossil fuels, and also showing that climate leadership in Scotland means something, and it's not just uh, it's not just guff. And so um, and just perhaps to kind of focus okay. minds out uh, back to what Sally was saying. These are those. Um, the five MSPs and the one pensioner representative. These are the really critical people who will ultimately make that decision about whether MSPs pensions um, go fossil free. So if you live in any of those places, and that's a reasonable coverage of the country actually, then you have an additional kind of extra ability to, to help win this campaign. Um, and um, uh, I hope that that's like a, a enticing invitation to take part in. Uh, what could be a really amazing um, uh, uh, for the fossil free movement. These are the different regions and we can share this document with you. So if you're looking to find your MSPs, you can find them here. And if you would like to get in touch with other campaigners, Divest Strathclyde and Fossil Free Glasgow are both really supportive and also Divest Strathclyde University in Glasgow. If you're in Edinburgh, there's Divest Lothian and Falkirk has Divest Falkirk. And Rick can help you put in touch with other campaigners around Scotland if you don't live in those particular areas. And if you would like an event in your area, we'd love to do something. So please just get in touch with us. Or if you have any other suggestions for really creative actions we could do for the campaign launch or for different events outside the parliament, that would be amazing too. Any way to get MSPs engaged in the campaign would be great. That's brilliant. And yeah, please do, if, if you've not been in touch with us individually before, then please do drop an email to parliament at divest.scot. And so we've got your contact and we can follow up with you about um, how you can get involved in, in your local area.